So I don't know why I expected the new form, the new transformation to happen in the episode a lot sooner than it actually ended up happening or that it actually ended up appearing. I thought for sure we were going to get it after the midpoint break of the episode, but instead we get Mastered Ultra Instinct as sort of like the cliffhanger of the episode, the finale, the, the final part, the ending of the episode leading on to the next episode. And it could be due to the level of anticipation and excitement for wanting to see this new form in action, uh, where in which sometimes when you get too excited over something, you, you tend to grow impatient, because I definitely caught myself feeling impatient, especially after that midpoint break. I was like, w okay, where's the new form? Where is it? Like, hello? And then I remembered that when Goku went Ultra Instinct for the first time, we didn't just get one episode. It was actually like a two-parter. It was like a two-episode event where in which we had the lead into the transformation, the actual transformation itself, and then we got to see the form in action. So I think maybe this, this new mastered Ultra Instinct form could have benefited from a two episode, a two part episode event, just like the first time that Goku went Ultra Instinct. Cause the preview we got for 130 looked freaking beastly. And we're gonna have to wait an extra week to get that. So I think splitting this one up was a mistake. Hopefully I'm wrong, but I just, right now, it honestly feels like it's it's just like ruining the momentum. So I definitely wish that we could have gotten both episodes back to back, but maybe that's just me being greedy. Cause I mean, look at Jiren. His composure as a character has been completely thrown out the window. I mean, look, look at the intensity. He has this brand new aura surrounding his outline. So he's obviously doing something else to match Goku's intensity. Like even with Goku completing Ultra Instinct, Jiren is still capable of holding his own. The main thing though, before I get to the things that I actually appreciated and liked about the episode, I do have to say that there was a lot of reused animation. Just super, super lazy reused animation. You have this shot right here. If it looks familiar, which it should, it's because it's from the opening. I mean, literally, just how lazy can you get reusing opening animations in, in this sequence? Like, And they reused it twice. And the thing is, like, uh, Weez had a very good speech describing uh, Goku's process. And it was so distracting the first time I watched the episode because of the reused animation. It's like, I'm sorry, Weez, I can't pay attention. This, this reused, rehashed, lazy animation is getting in the way of me appreciating your words, your speech. This shot again of Goku with the Kamehameha is a complete copy and paste, just straight up plagiarism from the Kefla episode. If you don't believe me, go rewatch that episode where Goku plugs that Kamehameha on Kefla's face to push her out of bounds. It's the exact same animation. And to keep it fair, there were some solid amount of good things in this episode. I remember like one of the opening shots is like this, this camera motion where it zooms in to Jiren and Goku. So you just kind of like, you feel like you're just entering the battle. I thought the use of Vegeta as a source of motivation for Goku in this episode worked very, very well. I mean, look at what he says. He says, I've placed my pride, my promise, everything in your hands. He says, step over the state of the gods, which is another way of saying surpass, just, just surpass the level of a god of destruction. Leave that in the dust, Goku. And his statement actually works very well with uh, some activity that's going on in the bleachers, in the stands, because if you take a look at this shot right here, these two gods, I think their names are Arak and Iwen or Iwan, whatever, they're gods from universes that were exempt from the tournament, that didn't participate, but they're giving each other a look. It's a very brief look. You might want to go back and check that out, but it's kind of like, what, what's going on here? Is, is, this, is this what we know? Is this the thing? To the point where by the end, the gods of destruction are just like, screw it, let's stand up. We have to get a better look at this. What is going on? And they just stand up. So I, was, I thought that was a very nice touch. Again, I was really surprised about how we got some pretty good exposition from a lot of people in the bleachers. So I'm just going to go down that list. I like Vegeta's argument, the way that he supported his argument about Goku being able to complete the form uh, based off of the feats of all of the other Saiyans that participated in the tournament. He said, you know, if we've improved this much, you saw how much the Saiyan race improved during what little time we had in the field, right? So it's like, it's kind of obvious that he's gonna be able to surpass it. You've already seen it, I love that. I also liked how there was a sense of doubt and frustration expressed from some of the team members of Universe 7 saying that they felt that Goku was still stuck in defense and that was true. He couldn't advance because he was still stuck in defense. He wasn't landing any hits. Like he has the dodging and defense down, but attack wise, he's just not doing anything to the point where he shoots that Kamehameha at Jiren. Jiren counters it completely and the show makes it seem as if the only reason 
uh, for why that's not a KO is because Goku used the energy of that Kamehameha that he shot down to protect himself. So he used it as a shield. So I thought that was great. I mean, maybe it wouldn't have been a KO, but still, like that would have been a direct hit and that would have cost Goku greatly. To add on top of that, there's even more information that we get from Whis in this episode. He says, he starts off by saying that the problem, the reason for why Goku is stuck is because he's still thinking way too much. He's still overthinking things and overthinking just doesn't go with Ultra Instinct. You can't embrace the, the fullness, the, the totality of the form if you keep thinking about how you're going to attack your opponent, how you're going to counterattack, and that's what Goku was doing. It's not until Goku actually closes his eyes to sort of like take the scene in, right, to sort of like meditate and just, just appreciate the moment that we start saying, like he actually smiles like, oh, there we go, there we go, that's how you do it. You just take it in, you live in the moment, you just let your instincts flow, you let your own muscle memory guide you through this thing, and you just counter, you start countering, but based, not out of thought, but based out of the flow of the fight. So you concentrate on your opponent, you concentrate on yourself, you concentrate in the moment, and you just go with it. Like it's, It has to be organic, it has to be this natural thing. He has to learn to bypass the speed of his own neurons telling his limbs to move. Because if he doesn't, that's just way, way too costly from a time perspective, and he won't be able to land any hits. By the way, there was kind of like this weird breathing exercise that Goku was doing during the episode. I don't know if you noticed that. Was I the only one who thought that it felt like he was about to, to spit on, on Jiren? It felt like he was just about to throw some phlegm at him. He was like... I just thought it was funny, even though the scene was kind of like supposed to be serious. But anyway, there's also this moment where Whis uh, basically introduces like this consequence to Goku using this mode. He says that the closer he gets to surpassing this stage or this state, uh, the bigger the drawback will be. So he says that once Goku's eyes stop glowing silver and go back to black, it'll be over. Like that's it. So he kind of like highlights the finality of this moment. But it's interesting that he's introducing like this consequence, like this drawback to using Ultra Instinct altogether. Because what that does in a way is that it sort of like introduces more room for improvement. So yay, more Dragon Ball stories coming your way after 2018, I guess. I already did a video talking about how there are some definite similarities between Jiren and Superman and the way that their power is showcased. And this episode is no exception to that. Jiren's eye power, what will look like this, this heat wave that he unleashes from his eyes, was all over this episode. There is a moment in this episode where he uses an attack that resembles the sun. We know Superman draws his energy from the sun, so it's that solar reference. He shoots it at Goku, he catches it and erases it like it's no big deal. A bunch of colors in this episode, a whole lot of explosions going on all over the place. Lightning, color, smoke balloons, all this crazy stuff. And so I'm sitting there watching this fight go down and I'm thinking to myself, wait, hold on, where is Frieza in all of this? Like, is he hiding under a rock to avoid getting hit? You think a rock would be enough to protect him at this point? I mean, the field has become a dangerous place. As if it wasn't before, right? No, but I think in this episode, it just kind of, I got that war zone vibe out of the field. It felt like a war zone. So where is Frieza hiding? Under some rocks? Like, we're supposed to believe that he's just going to be safe under some rocks? unconscious like maybe if he powered up or something he could tank some blasts i have two favorite moments in this episode the first one is where it seems like goku is essentially trapped on on this like bit of rock and under this dome and he's just there sort of like trying to tank or at least trying to take jiren's meteor punches that are raining down on him and all of a sudden based off of an observation from the people in the stands again the people in the stands were great in this episode they're like wait wait those are sparks flying, what's going on? So they see like And then they close up on Goku, they zoom in on him, and you see his arms vibrating so fast. And you know, and you know that he's punching the sky. He's trying to counter Jiren's meteors. And it just, it looks so cool. It just makes you think about his attack speed because you literally don't even see the movements. You just see his arms vibrating. It literally reminded me of something that like the Flash would be capable of doing where in which he vibrates his molecules so fast that he can bypass and, and go through solids essentially. So he pushes through and now he's using Ultra Instinct as a form of attack. Well now he can use both, ideally right, the defense 
and the offense. The actual moment of the transformation I thought was was okay. Like it didn't really hit me as hard as the first Ultra Instinct, but I thought this shot was incredible. I don't know if you noticed it, but if you look at his face, it literally looks like Goku has Jiren's face, and I'm sure that's intentional. I mean, look look how bright it is. It's just like it's it's obviously an intentional stylistic choice to have him look like Jiren, like an alien in this in this shot. It looked super eerie, but I really liked that. And then the second moment of the episode that I really liked was a little bit of a preview that we get in terms of the functionality of the form. Again, I'm all about functionality. If it looks cool, that's great and all, but I really want to know what can you do in this new form that you couldn't do before. And again, because this, this new transformation is kind of like the cliffhanger of the episode, we don't really get that much of it, but there was a moment, and I actually had to pause. There's this one action sequence where Jiren is about to, he's trying to land a punch on Goku. So he's coming in, not only does Goku completely dodge that punch, so he can't even hit him, but if you, if you look closely, he dodges the attack, and in less than a second, he's capable of landing four direct punches. You can count the punches based on the stars that you see over Jiren's body. I know in this shot you don't see four, but if you go back to watch that part, you see clearly see that he lands four hits. It goes so fast, it's like a nail gun. It's like... And the impact, the actual shockwave of those hits is delayed till a couple of moments later. And then right after that, we see that defense-wise, he's pretty much moving at the same speed, which, you know, we, we knew that he was blocking pretty much everything. Like, it was, it was just, that was the problem. He was stuck in defense. But now, I mean, look at, look at that speed. Overall, I thought the episode was okay. I think the dialogue really helps it out. Uh, but, again, I really wish that we would have gotten this episode paired up with 130, because I think that would have been fantastic. That's gonna do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you did. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. For more Dragon Ball Super reviews, I think there's only two episodes left, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so thank you, and I'll catch you guys later. Tell me your thoughts down below. Bye.